Hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm really excited about having Professor Chen here to discuss his uh, newest uh, article. Um, and let me get the title straight. Uh, I feel free to call me Bill, everyone. Okay. Uh, uh, Bill, Bill Chen has written an article, Epigenetics and Reparations, How Epigenetics Can Help Federal Plaintiffs Meet the Constitutional Article Three Standing Requirements in Reparations and Lawsuits. I am so excited about this article. As soon as I saw it, I called him up and pleaded with him to do a, a chat on this so that we can make this information more available to people so that people who are working in the reparations arena can have his information as something that they can use. So our plan for the day, it's not it's not a formal presentation of this whole article. That article is up on my website and I encourage you to take a look at it. The, what, uh, what I'm thinking, what I've asked uh, uh, Professor Chen to do is to just give us a, a short 15, 20 minutes overview of his ideas and concepts. Uh, and then we will take 15, 20 minutes of a discussion, as long as a, it's not a lot of people who are participating, we will just do questions and answers uh, as they come up. If we end up with a lot of people, we'll take a different, uh, we'll do a different method. Um, and then we'll end, we want to end, I, 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 he was very busy, but he agreed to do this, and and so we're going to kind of stay on time and end in an hour. Uh, um, I've no. We're, we're not busy, Vernelia. Life is good for all of us, right? We're, we're not busy. No, <laughs> it, it's great to be here. Thank you, Vernelia. Uh, go I, ahead, Vernelia. I just want to do a little, just a little bit. Uh, Professor Chen is a member of the executive committee for the minorities group section of the Association of American Law Schools and the award committee for this section on legal writing, reasoning, and research. He was a commissioner on the Oregon Commission on Asian Affairs. He served on the planning committee of the Asian American Youth Leadership Conference, and he was the chair of the Oregon State Bar's Legal Heritage Interest Group. Uh, Professor Chan is a member of the Legal Writing Institute and the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, serving on various committee. I've known him quite a while. He's given numerous uh, presentations on clear writing team, leadership, scholarship, but to our theme, he does a lot of work on race and culture issues. Uh, I'm so happy that he has joined us today, and uh, Professor Chan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vern Ilya, for, for that introduction. And I also teach race and the law. And it's great to be here with everyone. And let's have an informal chat. I, I'm not going to bore you with, with a recitation of the article, but but love to chat with all of you about uh, questions you might have about uh, biotechnology and, and, and reparations and, and, and um, the legal issue involving standing. And so briefly, my 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 article um, addresses, I think, three concepts that come come together. Number one, that's modern technology, specifically um, technology in the realm of understanding the DNA, um, the gene, and the genome, which is the field of epigenetics. And the second thing that that's connected is uh, uh, this, this this thing called legal standing that everyone must 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 overcome uh, who wants to file a lawsuit. And the third thing that that's interconnected is this notion of justice, right? Justice for a large group of people in the United States um, who in, in the period of who who were enslaved in, in the past and, and now with with their um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and descendants um, might want to seek um, a sense of justice or a semblance of justice. And that's why I began my article with. A quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, "Justice delayed is justice denied." But in in any case, I I like to hear from from any of you if you have questions. And 
and we can go through your, your questions and and thereby address m m many of the points uh, in in my article. And and, and again, my, my article is is basically a, a treatise on how reparation plaintiffs plaintiffs today who wanted to file a lawsuit in federal court, for example, could overcome the standing issue. And just very briefly, the standing issue is a threshold issue. It just means if I or you, let's say me, if, if I wanted to file a lawsuit now, it has to meet this thing called the standing requirement. And, and that just means this. I have to argue an injury, a real injury. Second, there must be a connection between my injury and the 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 acts of the wrongdoer. And third, the the court, if it rules in my favor, must be able to give me something that that redresses my um alleged um injury. So for example, if 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 I'm I'm alleging that someone hit me um when driving, right, and struck me, I I can't say, hey friend, uh be be in place of me in this lawsuit I'm filing against the driver because I don't like to go to court and I'm pretty busy right now. Uh, the court would look at my friend and say, are you the proper person in this lawsuit? And the court would say, well, for standing issues, this threshold issue, you, my friend, you can't be here because I'm the actual person who was hurt, right, with the injury. I, I can't send my friend to court for me. And so that's just a simple example of the, the standing issue. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much. Uh, any thoughts so far on on the article and this whole notion of reparation? I'm not so sure how how many yeah. people have actually read the article, but could okay. I ask you to just explain what, just very briefly, epigenetics and how yeah. it relates to reparations? Th thank you, Vernelia. So if epigenetics is the following, it it basically refers to these chemical markers that are attached to the DNA, the gene. Now, the DNA is that spiral helix, right, consisting of four letters. And we've seen that, that pictorial uh, since we were kids. Now, that's the genetic sequence that which is is basically a, a blueprint or a recipe for building you and me our bodies right we all have this thing called the genetic sequence consisting of those four letters that is like a blueprint a recipe book uh, the recipe book being how to create a body now epigenetics refers not to the sequence of the letters but to again, these molecules are, are chemical markers on top or around the genetic sequence. And those genetic markers can be affected by stressors in the environment. Let's say uh, a famine or nutritional deficiency or um, being in traumatic situation, uh, uh, su 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 such as, um, physical injuries, right? And those external stressors, famine, um, physical harm to a person, can affect what's called the epigenome. And again, the epigenome involves these chemical markers on the genetic sequence. And these genetic markers can persist over generations from the first generation to the second to the third to the fourth. And because they persist over time, one can argue that descendants today of enslaved uh, people several generations ago are still suffering from the enslavement trauma of several generations ago. So a plaintiff today, let's say an African-American, a black person filing a lawsuit today can possibly establish a causal connection between the plaintiff today and the enslaved ancestor several generations ago through these epigenetic markers, which 
are in the plaintiff today due to the trauma suffered by the enslaved um, ancestor several generations ago. And the, the main point of my article is that biotechnology science, epigenetic science, genetic science, DNA science of today has led us to the point where I argue in my paper, a reparation plaintiff filing a lawsuit for reparations today could overcome this threshold requirement called the standing requirement in, in court. And so in a nutshell, um, that, that's my thesis. And and you, you you still might be thinking about epigenetics and epigenetic markers. What, what is that? Now, let, let me let me offer this analogy. Let's say that the the DNA that that we all have in our body, that DNA, which again is the recipe book on how to create the body, our body. So so the DNA um, is the book, the recipe book. Let's let's imagine a recipe book the recipe book on how to create our body. That recipe book consists of letters, words, sentences, paragraphs, pages, right? So that's that's the script or the recipe. In this book, if we took colored markers and let's say mark certain parts of the pages or a certain paragraph, uh, blue here, pink here, uh, orange there, those colored markings are analogous to the epigenetic markers in our body if our um, ancestors had suffered some trauma and they left those epigenetic markers in their descendants and those epigenetic markers which are basically molecules on top of the dna on top of the gene sequence those epigenetic markers, which are real things, could persist into today's plaintiff's bodies. And those epigenetic markers, which again are analogous to, to the color-coded marks on, on the recipe book, those epigenetic markers basically tell a gene whether to be turned on or off. That's called gene expression. Now, whether a gene is turned on or off affects our body because genes uh, play a crucial role in the development of, of our bodies. And if a certain gene is supposed to be turned on, but it's turned off or vice versa, it should be turned off, but it's turned on, then the body can develop and manifest diseases and other harmful physiological symptoms. Now, I, I'm sorry, I keep, I keep talking a lot. So, <laughs> Stop me at any point, Vernelia. And, and so that, that's, in a nutshell, um, some details about epigenetics and uh, genes and the DNA sequence. Okay, so I think the, we can entertain questions, uh, for, 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 uh, Professor Chen, uh, if you would unmute yourself and ask if you have a question to ask. And, and again, call me Bill, everyone. Our bill. Yeah. Call me and, Professor Randall. <laughs> <laughs> I shall, Professor Randall. Yeah, and, no. <laughs> and, and and again, I'll add this extra point. The the standing issue is the first part of litigation. So so remember that my paper, my my article is very focused. It doesn't say, it doesn't assert that if an African American, if a black plaintiff today files a reparation lawsuit that she will win in court. Um, I'm not talking about the trial stage. That comes later. And that involves a different standard of proof. At the at the threshold stage, which is called the pleading stage, which my article talks about, at the initial stage when the reparation plaintiff files the lawsuit, that that standard merely involves only a general factual allegation. It, it, it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt or anything like that. That comes later, right? Um, so the, this low threshold at the standing stage, at the pleading stage, is general factual allegation. And I argue in my paper that at this initial stage, the standing, the pleading stage, 
that general factual allegation low threshold can be met uh, due, due to modern science and 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 the 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 the, the field of epigenetics today. And and, and again, um, any thoughts or comments so far from from anyone? Uh, lo love to chat in, instead of my being this talking head on on the Zoom. I would like to say a, a few words. If oh yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, hosting this, Professor Randall. I'm a Queen Mother Nina Womack here in Los Angeles, California, but I'm also a coronated Queen of Development in Ghana, West Africa. And so um, as a person of African descent, um, understanding that my personal family background <laughs> does come from this uh, transatlantic slave trade, and seeing the, being able to assess the uh, health disparities that people of African descent are going through, not only here in America, but also in Africa, I've been studying a lot about epigenetics. And uh, I was on a webinar maybe about four or five months ago, um, this uh, these scientists, these researchers were doing, we're talking about epigenetics, and they use the example of the uh, Dutch population, who, yeah, you know, they were um, deprived of, of food, they were uh, starved, and how they're still experiencing health issues. So I asked on the uh, webinar, I said you know, after they presented their findings, I said, well, wouldn't you say, is it safe to say that this is exactly what people of African descent are also going through? That's why we have health disparities such as obesity and cardiovascular diseases and so forth. And they said, yes, it, it, it would be pretty safe to say that, but unfortunately there hasn't been enough research done on people of African descent. So, you know, so my, I would love to read your article, uh, Bill. And my question is, how do we, or who do we need to go to, to get the necessary funding to do this research? Uh, I, I, I'll say, and, and thank you for, for the reference to, to the Dutch famine um, situation, uh, that event. And I, I reference it in, in my article and, just, just very briefly, two points on that. I, I think in general, that famine event can, can be supporting evidence uh, um, that allows a court to say, yes, reparation plaintiff of today, you you, you can overcome the thresh, the, the standing issue. But I think there there might be two possible issues with, with the famine um, event. One is it, it's a more recent event. It, it doesn't extend back multiple generations so 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 um a court might say oh the the famine event it, it's it's a more recent event and second i think with with the famine event it the the current researchers i think didn't probe directly into whether it's an epigenetics mechanism they they might have looked at other mechanisms to to determine that there's a um a famine effect that continues on into the current generation. So I, I, I think I think those current researchers of the famine event were looking possibly at other transgenerational mechanisms. But but in general, I I, I agree with you. I, I think the famine event is still relevant. To your other question um about who who do we go to 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 talk with the relevant researchers. In general, I would say there there are current researchers who are doing epigenetics research, and I think their research into, for example, uh, using worms or mice or or other um, uh, 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 mammals, um, they they are relevant. And I, I put some of those research studies into my article. I, I hear what you're saying. What what about what about research? involving um people humans and epigenetics and and one problem with um the type of epigenetics research that would be robust and strong is that to have that robust and strong research we would have to do unethical things to people so i i know you're not saying that so i i know you're not saying 
hey, we, we've got to put people through these trauma situations and see what happens. I know you're not saying that, but in general, one problem of um, using people as research subjects is that ethical problem of, well, we can only do certain things, right? And not other things to people when we use them as test subjects. Um, uh, a comment. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. No, that's, I'm sorry. Uh, did you, I don't remember whether it's in your paper or not, which I read, but uh, the research on the children who were born out of the storm uh, on the West Coast that were followed for years. Uh, there was um, 10, 15 years ago, I've been uh, 10 to 15 years ago, maybe even more, there was this huge storm on the East Coast that shut down everything for weeks. Uh, and subsequent to that full storm, they babies were born. They uh, women who were that they were pregnant during this storm, and the babies were born after that storm. And then they followed the children and compared them to children who were were born but not in the storm. And those children had more illness than the children who who mothers did who didn't go through that storm. And so that's one comment. I don't know, could you, the second thing is I'm not sure that it's, ne I mean, I think research on African, uh, uh, descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States would be important to helping us figure out the health issues and how to deal with them from an epigenetic point of view. But do you think, Bill, that it would be necessary to have that specific research in order to get into court? I, uh, thank, thank you, Professor Randall. Uh, re regarding that particular uh, storm event, I, I don't think I, I included that in, in my paper, um, but, but that's not to say it's not relevant. I, I do believe that real world situations, including your storm event or the famine event. And there have been others, right? There, there's research on how the depression dur during the, uh, in, in America uh, uh, during the thirties also affected um, descendants. I, I believe that type of research um, involving these real world trauma situations can be in general helpful to reparation plaintiffs the the thing with those types of research though is whether they look specifically at Japan, epigenetics as the transgen transgenerational mechanism or whether they looked at other mechanisms and there are other mechanisms that researchers can look at um to answer your question uh, professor randall of whether we need specifically epigenetic evidence and evidence of these epigenetic markers in present-day plaintiffs to show a connection of harm from ans uh, descendants, uh, ancestors uh, generations ago. I think it bolsters today's reparation plaintiffs to, to make that type of epigenetics connection. And, and that's why I focus on epigenetics because, again, in the standing requirement that courts require, part of part of the requirement is that the injury must be particular and concrete to the person who's filing the lawsuit and that that particular and concrete injury found in today's reparation plaintiff the person filing the lawsuit must also be causally connected to the descendants generations ago and and to me, and that's why I wrote this article to say maybe epigenetic markers, right? These actual real differences in the person's cell, in the person's gene today, those differences today could maybe serve as this evidence, as evidence of particular concrete harm that can be established through a causal connection to uh, descendants uh, to ancestors in the enslaved period generations ago. So, Professor Randall, um, 
I, I think I think finding epigenetics evidence would provide stronger proof allowing the court to say to today's reparation plaintiff, yes, you have met the threshold standing requirement. You can go forward in your lawsuit seeking reparations. Now, I, I don't I don't want to undermine other mechanisms of transgenerational harm. I, I think other researchers talking about other mechanisms can can provide helpful evidence also to today's reparation plaintiff. So I, I think strategically today's reparation plaintiff, um, who someone today, for example, wanting to file a reparations lawsuit can make several arguments. One being based on epigenetics evidence that my article talks about. But my article focusing on epigenetics evidence should not be the only strategy, I think, for today's reparation plaintiffs. So you, you make a great point, Professor Randall, that that my, my epigenetics focus should not be the sole argument for meeting the, the standing um, requirement. Can I um, just interject here, too? Is yes. What I was saying is there has yet to be any epigenetic research on African-Americans. So when you look at, because I've been doing a lot of research on um, our health disparities. So when you look at why are African-Americans the most obese out of all the other ethnicities? Why are there uh, infant mortality deaths for black babies as opposed to white babies? Like I know without a shadow of a doubt that this correlates to the damage of, in our in our genes. That's why we have these infant deaths and in, in all of these health disparities. I know that. I fully agree with you that epigenetic research on certain groups, including African-Americans, Black, Black Americans, would be very productive and, and informative. Um, and the further question might be, well, why, why isn't there that research uh, Yet. I, I think, yeah, go go ahead, Professor Randall. Well, I, I think that this is this is the lar this goes in the problem, and I'll put it on this to invite someone. The larger problem of why of including doing research that is specific to African Americans and the issues they have. And the only really strong area that is done is on er the area of sickle cell, but we are not included in research studies. Research studies are not targeted for us, and that's the wider problem. I, but my 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 thought though is that that's a sep that's an issue that we need to deal with. We shouldn't wait on going into court to get that solved. That I, we, uh... that my son Shaka. Yeah, I and I know it wanders a little bit from the topic of your article, Bill, in terms of standing, but the idea that even to get standing, there's got to be a connection between your assertion of the claim and harm. How do we how do we prove that this epigenetics connects to a harm that is? And I think that's I think that's the question that's that that's kind of been brought up is how do we do how do we connect the fact, the existence of epigenetics uh, and the interger intergenerational um, impact on DNA of past harms to a current harm. How do we how do we right. make that connection? So in, to the extent you're asserting standing, we still have to, as an individual plaintiff, I would still have to demonstrate how I was harmed. Epi and would I have to, would it have to be in the same context in terms of epigenetically to suggest that I've had these outcomes because of uh, the epigenetics that we're talking about. Uh, how do we, how, how do we, I, I kind of feel like there's a gap there. How do we bridge that gap between the harm that we, I mean, I think I um, feel pretty comfortable assuming that we all agree that there's still an ongoing and, uh, and pernicious real harm from slavery, but how do we connect uh, our epigenetic standing argument to a demonstrable harm. Right, great thought there. Th thank you for the question. And there are multiple parts that, that have to be connected by the reparation plaintiff of today. 
and and let, let's go through some of these parts. Um, let's imagine um, an African American, uh, a Black American plaintiff filing a, a reparation lawsuit today in court. Here's one possible way, and feel free to to add your thoughts. This is just my 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 thought process here uh, to to answer your question. The the African American plaintiff, the Black American plaintiff of today could um and and I, I i talk about this in my article there's this part where it says reparation plaintiffs can undergo tests to show that they have epigenetic alteration so there there is that technology available today to to look into a person's epigenome um the the cell the the gene structure to to see if there are epigenetic alterations and that's one part, right? To to say, hey, um, this this person, this reparation plaintiff of today, after undergoing this test, has shown that uh, she he has epigenetic alterations. Then another part would be to use lineage trees, um, ancestral information, to connect that reparation plaintiff of today to um, an ancestor um, who lived during the, let's say the enslaved period, um, and who lived during a period where um, there were state laws and, and federal laws and other laws that, that allowed for um, abuses to, to occur against that um, ancestor. And and it might strengthen it would strengthen the case even if there was documentation of this um, ancestor having suffered harm or trauma, right, um, or or some other um, egregious event that that then as the that being the external environment created epigenetic changes in the ancestor because we have all this research showing that. External stressors, environmental trauma can affect a person's epigenome, leaving markers and such. So once once we have that, right, that is that is the 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 ancestor having suffered external trauma, and we have today's plaintiff showing epigenetic markers or epigenetic alterations, and that the today's reparation plaintiff is connected to the enslaved um, ancestor, then that, that begins that path to showing today's reparation plaintiff has suffered transgenerational harm due to the harm suffered by the descendant who lived in that enslaved period. We that's, the, that, that's the beginning that's the beginnings of an answer. Uh, keep, uh, go ahead, Professor Randall. No, we just, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We have another speaker, another guest. Oh, here. yes, 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 please, please. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for the, this Inter discussion. Please uh, introduce my yourself. Is, okay, go ahead. Sorry. My name is uh, Sipiwe Baleka. I am the founder of the Balanta Brasa History and Genealogy Society in America. And I'm the coordinator of what is called the Lineage Restoration Movement. Um, 800,000 um, African Americans have taken the African Ancestry DNA test to identify um, who they come from. Uh, I am actually calling you from Guinea-Bissau, which is the my ancestral homeland of my Balanta people. Um, one of the things that we are doing and that I wish I could get funding for is we are helping people identify that ancestor that survived the Middle Passage and then the village and potentially the families uh, here in Guinea-Bissau uh, and be able to do various kinds of testing on the Balanta people here in Guinea-Bissau and the Balanta people in America. Now, um, I, my, my question was, in trying to make these connections, because I a year ago, I filed 
uh, uh, an ethnocide petition that used transgenerational epigenetics um, uh, at the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. And I've dropped the link to that. Anybody can read it. I dropped that in the chat. And I shared this with Professor Randall uh, when I was doing my research. Um, and at that time, I was trying to take the evidence of the science that we have now. We know that the environmental trauma, right, induces epigenetic encoding, et cetera, and connect that to the legal concepts of preconception tort, prenatal torts, um, negligent torts, where um, the law recognizes uh, certain damage from crime at the moment of your conception. Uh, I just wanted to know if you had um, considered this and if it's helpful, um, and I'll just listen. Thank you. No, I, I think I think the the research you're looking into is is very helpful because again you're you're trying to establish links between people today and and descendants from generations uh, and ancestors from generations ago. So I I believe from a legal perspective, filing a lawsuit perspective, that anything that strengthens that that causal link. Right, the link between today, today's plaintiff and the 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 ancestors generations ago, anything that strengthens that link is is helpful, especially at the standing stage where again it's a lower threshold. All one has to do is to plead general factual allegations, and I, I think your type of research would help strengthen that causal connection, but, but between today's plaintiffs and the the ancestors from generations ago. And, and I and thank you thank you for that link. I later on, Professor Randall, uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to find that link and and take a closer look at what what our, our, our commentator just just talked about. I'll be sure to send you the link from the chat. Uh, do you think that? Okay, I'm a uh, I was born and raised during Jim Crow, and there are a lot of us who are still alive. I've been thinking that we keep talking about reparations for slavery, but we would have a more direct link. I'm not moving that. I'm not suggesting that we don't talk about reparations for slavery. I'm suggesting that we also talk about reparations for Jim Crow and that we take the people who are still alive, like myself, as plaintiffs. Yeah, I, uh, Professor Randall, I agree with you that from a a standing requirement issue that, that is would it be easier for um a reparation plaintiff to overcome this standing requirement in court to argue that my harms are from the Jim Crow era I I believe so yes because um let, let's say there's a survivor today from the Jim Crow era who files a a a, 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 a reparations lawsuit standing is easily met because that person is there it's that person suffered harms from the Jim Crow era, right? Which, and and so, yes, the standing issue can be more easily be met. I, I think there are other obstacles though when one tries to argue reparations based on the Jim Crow era harms. One argument, and, and this goes beyond my my article, but, but we, we can talk about it. One obstacle is that some might counter by saying, well, in the Jim Crow era, undoubtedly, bad things happened to to uh, uh, communities of color and people of color in that area. In that era, but the counter argument goes: um, at this time during Jim Crow, um, the laws um, promoting slavery and discrimination they they are gone, right? So there's no um, formal laws now during the Jim Crow era that said continue to discriminate uh, racially, continue to to impose slavery, uh, continue to uh, subjugate um, entire group of people. Now, that's how the counter argument could go to say there are no more laws like that, right? Um, but there are no, and, more, no, no more laws promoting slavery, but there definitely right. are laws promoting Jim Crow. I hear you. And and the counter argument people would say, 
Well, there, sure, there, 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 there are um, state laws and and things like that. But but at the federal level, right? Uh, we we have new constitution. Uh, uh, we have new amendments now that that granted rights and and uh, to to everyone. And so I, I'm not I'm not arguing against you, no, Professor I'm Randall. Saying, I, I'm merely yeah. saying that that's how some commentators or or or. Uh, 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 others might might argue against the Jim Crow era argument for reparations, but I think there's some. Uh, but I think there is an argument there, and I think if one makes an argument for reparations based on the Jim Crow era, it would e more easily overcome the standing requirement. But Ray, I unmuted. I mean, I uh, lowered someone's hand and then forgot who it was. Oh, and my then, apologies. And I um, had a comment too. I can't even raise my hand on here. I don't see the feature, but this is Queen Nina again. But go on, Brother Safiwe. I think your hand was up first since I couldn't. Yeah, I just, thank you, Queen Mother Wilmack. Um, I just had a, a quick follow-up. There was an aspect that I didn't want to be overlooked, which is in the law, there's this concept of prenatal tort preconception tort, um, negligence tort, um, and connecting, you know, that's sort of right now the law's way of kind of acknowledging what transgenerational epigenetics is saying. So even if, you know, one of the previous speakers was saying as an individual, I still have this burden to connect them. And I wanted your opinion on, even if we can't, make the 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 hard connection between say that ancestor uh that survived the middle passage a specific damage that was done say in 1701 that now is exacerbated in you know 1981 uh, when you're born even if we can't get to that level if there's enough um scientific evidence that says yes environmental trauma does have damages, then we can say, okay, um, use the concept of pre. I was born with this tort damage, this preconception tort, or this prenatal tort. Uh, I just wondered if anybody had ever considered that, um, and how we could use that. Are you? Yeah, I, I think I think that pre preconception tort argument, a uh, prenatal. Um, argument might might be valid i i would have to take a closer look at that um argument and, and maybe you can add your thoughts here is is that tort argument focus on the damage um let's say to the to the embryo uh to to the to to that entity yes it, the okay. idea is that i was born with this Right, um, You're right. That person, while while in a uterus, was was affected by something, yeah. right? I and I I think that can work, but that that would be an argument for I, I think um let's say a Jim Crow type period argument because if if the harm is to that person while that person was let's say an embryo. Then it extends only that far back, right? It it would not extend, let's say, multiple generations back to the enslaved period. Is my thought. Well, that's actually w exactly what I was trying to say. That because transgender is multi generational, that and it affects the DNA preconception, meaning before I was even conceived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was damage that at the moment of conception is transferred. Right. Yes, and and if you're, and, and I agree with you, there's re research showing that to be the case. And that's why my, my article focuses on the epigenetics alterations that can occur in, in the uterus, right? In, in the embryo of, and so that epigenetic alteration caused by external stressors, let's say, uh, um, in in a descendant multiple generations ago in the enslaved period, those epigenetic markers, those epigenetic alterations can be transferred 
to that that embryo who becomes a parent who then has children whose children then have their own children and so on. Yes, I, I agree with you that that type of epigenetic change that occurs even in, in, in the embryo can pass transgenerationally. Um, and, and so, yes, yes. And there is, and my, my article talks about how, how uh, epigenetic alterations in, in other test subjects, let's say mice um, or, or the wor worms, has shown that epigenetic alterations can survive through the first, second, third, fourth, and in worms, uh, even even past the fourth generation. And so I, I I'm agreeing with you that yes, epigenetic alterations can persist over multiple generations, which means a plant a reparation plaintiff today possibly can establish that link all the way back to someone um, who lived in the enslaved period. And and you you and and when I mentioned the, the the mice and and worm research, some might argue, how is that relevant? How, you know, aren't they different? But but worm research is very prevalent. Many researchers use worms, and they they are they are very helpful because because they have cells also that are analogous to to human cells, and also with worms, one can study them for multiple generations in, in a few days or weeks, right? One doesn't have to wait right, 100, 200 years, right? With worms, you get multiple generations uh, after being subject. Uh, one can subject worms to trauma, see what happens to multiple generations w within a short time. And now with, with mice, uh, mice share many characteristics with humans because both are mammals. And so mice studies uh, that that talk about that show epigenetic alterations that persist across multiple generations can also be used, I believe, by reparation plaintiffs to overcome the the standing requirement. And so, when when I mention um, worm and mice studies, I I don't want anyone to think, oh, what, why are you going there, Bill, with with these other studies that aren't human studies? Well, there's been a lot of studies using them. They they are valid studies. Courts have used mice and rice. Uh, mice uh, and, and worm studies in other contexts. So I, I think for the reparation attorneys and reparation plaintiffs, they, they shouldn't shy away from mice and uh, um, uh, worm studies. And and that, also, yeah, go ahead, Professor Randall. No, I was going to say the fact is is that this is a matter of getting an expert witness who can yeah. talk about the strength of not just in trans. You would the strength of mice and worm and other non-human studies, uh, the validity of those, uh, and the court within once the court accept that the mice and worm studies are valid ways of proving things, then then it it would you you would get you'd be able to get someone on the stand to testify to that. Uh, right. I think that. That mice and worm studies are used a lot. Uh, Non-human studies are used a lot in tort litigation. Exactly right, Professor Randall. And and you also mentioned another point that is getting into the courtroom, where at that point each side hires expert witnesses, for example, right? And so that's that's part of my thinking, and it's not very explicit in my article, but but I'm thinking this that. In in 2024 today, I believe there is enough scientific medical evidence, epigenetic evidence, to allow a reparation plaintiff to overcome that pleading stage requirement called standing. And pleading just means, hey, the, the plaintiff has to file this document. Uh, it's called pleadings, right? That says, here, here's my harm. Here is my allegation. I believe reparation plaintiffs has... They they have enough epigenetic epigenetic evidence to overcome the standing requirement. Now, once we get into the trial stage, where each side, for example, can hire its attorneys and its expert witnesses to talk about worm studies, mice studies, human studies, then I think I think jurors 
can then listen in and, and hear the evidence. And I think the reparation plaintiff, given all that evidence that, that Professor Randall mentioned, I, I think reparation plaintiffs can, can do a pretty good job of being convincing to, to the jurors. Now, if you want to ask me further, well, well, um, is, 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 why, why then, if, if, if I think that at the trial stage, there's a possibility of winning when making arguments to the jury, then why doesn't it even get past a threshold stage, which should be a lower stage? And I, I can share my thoughts here that goes beyond the the, the legal um, issues. I, I sometimes wonder, and please share your thoughts, I, I sometimes wonder if if judges, especially the judges in the African-American litigation, where that was a 2005 case, where, where reparation plaintiffs, attorneys for uh, Black Americans, African Americans filed a lawsuit arguing for reparations when, when they alleged that hey, um, today's companies such as insurance companies and banks, their predecessors uh, during the period of enslavement, they gain and benefit from slavery, and so today in 2005, we're going to file a reparation lawsuit against them. And then the court, the judge said, no, you you don't meet the standing requirement. You fail to show a particular harm to you, reparation plaintiffs today, and you fail to show this causal connection to to your um, uh, uh, ancestors uh, during the enslaved period. Now, now my, my article goes through um, multiple points arguing how that, that, that court decision in 2005 and then the appellate decision in 2006 were flawed. But, but apart from the legal issue, I, I sometimes wonder if judges and courts, they just think in general, the enslavement period was too long ago. It's it's going to create too, too many um, frivolous lawsuits if we allow this reparations lawsuit to be, to be allowed to proceed to the trial stage. This is just too impossible. And in fact, one, one of the decisions said this, this is an impossible to task. To show a connection between today's reparation plaintiffs and the harms to descendants generations ago. Can I? But I'm in? just adding. I'm just adding my 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 own personal thoughts here. Um, and and I'm I'm going a bit beyond my article. But but I'm I'm sorry. Did I cut off someone? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a comment on yes, that yes, and to address what Professor Randall was saying. First of all, uh, Professor Randall, Robin told me about you, and that's how um, you know I've connected with you and got on this uh, webinar because I uh, really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's uh, right in line with with uh, where I'm going to. But um, what I was what I had told Robin uh, recently is that uh, I had been doing some public health research on the uh, EPA's website. And there is data that shows that in Black communities in the U.S., we are more exposed to environmental pollution, um, you know, industrial warehousing and so forth. And uh, part of the U United Nations, uh, our basic human rights is the right to clean air and, as you guys know, housing and food and so forth. So surely our environmental rights, for example, have been uh, violated today, not a uh, 100 years ago, 400 years ago, but right now as we speak. So I feel like putting that case together with the Jim Crow, with the epigenetics, we definitely have a case to stand on now because this has been a strategic and the EPA now is giving out funds to underserved communities through the uh, Inflation Reduction Act to clean up our environments because they saw that this is a systemic racist issue when it comes to air pollution. Uh, th th thank you for, for those thoughts. And, and and I've done some research on environmental uh, uh, injustice, right? And, and you're exactly right. For example, there, there's research showing that in the past and, and possibly currently, when governments think about where to, let's say, um, place their freeways or highways, right? Uh, in many instances, and also in Portland here, they 
they put that freeway or highway right, right through the African American community or, or the black community, right? It just and here in Portland, the, the, the freeway just runs right through what was in the past a, a very um traditional, uh traditionally uh, African American community. And that increases rates of asthma, right? Increases rates of breathing disorders and all sorts of environmentally based um physiological problems. And also, your, your comment touches upon the siting of, let's say, um, polluting companies. Where, where are these polluting companies placed, right? And, and we have many, many accounts of um, communities of color, including Black communities, protesting the siting of, let's say, a very pollution-producing company in their neighborhood. But, but that's what happens sometimes. Companies uh, place their polluting producing company in, in African-American communities or, or communities of color. And we can go into the reasons why. So, some include, hey, it's easier, right? Uh, the thought is African community, community African-American communities or communities of color, they, they they lack the political clout to to really fight us, right? To file lawsuits against us and all of that. But but thank you. Thank you for that thought about how there are many environmental pollutants for based on many reasons that that impact uh, African American communities and, and communities of color. Uh, there, there was a uh, Professor Randall. There's a I think a question here in the chat. One is, does epigenetics reveal disparate impact based on race? Uh, do, do, do you, do you want to get into those, Professor Randall? But but go ahead and and follow your your um sequence. Well, Professor we Randall. only have a minute left. And oh, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I, I, I kind of wanted to start wrapping things up and just uh, the epigenetics. I think what we can do is this we can we can show that there's been a disparate impact on health that is generational. That's what my research has shown, dating all the way from slavery through now. Well, I haven't done anything for the last 10 years, but there's there so we can show that the, the health disparity. And now we can talk, we have a way of showing how, why and how that disparity exists and we can connect it generationally. So, so, so we've got those things, those kinds of things that we can show. But I think there hasn't been epigenetic studies on humans so we can't show that based on race, but I don't think it's necessary in order to uh, uh, in order to think. We've we've gone an hour. Do you have last thoughts, uh, comments you want to make? I, I, just 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 a thought uh, that that begins with my my um, article that says justice delayed is justice denied, and then I end my article by saying. If courts really take a look at the epigenetics evidence and other transgenerational harm evidence, they should allow reparation plaintiffs today to meet the standing requirement so that that reparations lawsuit can move beyond the pleading stage to, to go into the courtroom, where I think that's where it belongs, so that each side can present its evidence and let, let the decision maker, the jury, decide at that point. And thank you, everyone. For, for being being such a wonderful community of of concerned activists and and, and intellectual thinkers and and just uh, uh, helping me think through this and thank you Professor Randall and, and your thank son for for helping. You. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen. Thanks all of my guests. I sure appreciate it. This is the first time I've done something like this in a long time, but I'm really pleased with the turnout and will definitely do more. Uh, thank you for coming. And my son is already gone, but I want to thank him for agreeing to come on and help me if I need it. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Wonderful discussion. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Absolutely.